So like I said, we're going to cover uh, our workflow first. So this is our whole process for how we go about coding responsive emails, responsive HTML emails. This is the overview of the process. The first thing we do is we code the email using a text editor. And while we're coding it, we verify how it looks inside of a web browser. So before we send the actual email, we're verifying what it looks like in a web browser. After we've coded it, we inline the email. We run it through a test suite. And then lastly, we send it using email service provider. And we'll go through each of those steps in detail. So starting with the text editor. HTML emails, they usually have complex nested code. They're obviously very different than when you're writing just a casual email to someone on your team. So you definitely don't want to try to code them in something like Microsoft Word. Uh, any of the kind of what you see is what you get editors are not going to work for emails because we need to actually code the structure of the email. We're not just creating something using like a rich text editor. Here at Zurb, we're split between Sublime Text and Coda when it comes to editors. Um, the reason that editors are so important for email and for anything when you're writing code is that you spot patterns when you're coding. So anywhere where the patterns break, your code is often broke as well. So here it makes it visually very easy to see that you have two closed tags that are the same little indentation, indicating you probably have too many closed tags and you've copied and pasted that stuff incorrectly. The editors have features that are going to make your life just a lot easier when you're coding, coding emails. Uh, just simple things like indentation. So this is a pretty uh, standard rule that applies in all code. When you have tags that open and close, you want them to be on the same level of indentation. It makes it a lot easier to find and properly close tags. Some editors even let you uh, fold those tags down at the indentation levels to collapse them so you can more easily kind of see how your stuff is chunked together. Sublime Text has kind of a cool feature where it tracks the indentation level for you. It has this nice gray dotted line between the open and the close tag that you can use to visually see how they're attached to each other. White space is another uh, underrated feature of a text editor. Maybe it's not even a feature, but just a way to clearly communicate what you're doing with your code. Just like if you were writing um, a blog post or a very long email, you would use paragraphs to kind of chunk what you were talking about. The same thing is true in code. So by putting a line break before and after a block, you can chunk your code blocks to make it more readable by other people. So here in our email, we have our table TRTD combo that you'll see quite a bit. And if you've ever written uh, layouts back when tables were used for layout a while ago, you're probably familiar with this. So uh, the table TRTD is used to represent a column inside of a row inside of a container. So we have three chunks. So you kind of visually see how they're chunked based on that white space that we have. Emmet.io is a pretty cool tool for being able to generate a lot of markup very quickly. And as you've already seen, when we're coding emails, we have to use tables. So we're going to have a lot more markup than we would even for a, for a website. So having tools and mechanisms for keeping all of this HTML manageable is, is pretty important in writing maintainable emails that someone else can edit later and somebody can potentially read. Emmet.io is basically snippets on steroids. So for example, if you have a UL with an ID of navigation, and inside of that, you have an LI with an I, uh, a class of item, and let's see in a second what the dollar sign for means. And within that, you have an anchor tag, which contents or item dollar sign. You can write this little snippet, and it will expand it out into the markup. So the star is the multiplier. So you're saying, I want this element four times. And the dollar sign is substituted for the iteration that you're on if you're inside of a loop. So here you can see the dollar sign is substituted for one, two, three, four. The uh, brackets, the curly brackets, indicate that it's the contents of this anchor tag. And then here it's item one, two, three, four substituted in. So that's a pretty simple example. Uh, another one that's probably more realistic if you write an email is something like you have a table with a class container. Inside that, you have a TRTD. Inside the TD, you have another table with a class row, which has its TRTD. It has a wrapper class on the TD and a class of last. Inside that one, we have another table with the class 12 columns. It has a TRTD and a TD expander, which generates you know, the huge amount of market that you need there. In general, it's, it's, pretty, it's much simpler to just copy and paste the markup that you need. If you're working with uh, an email template or a framework like Ink where you know what markup that you want, if you are uh, writing a lot of custom markup and you're already familiar with what you need, this thing like Emma is going to make your life a lot easier because, again, there's just so much markup to be written. So that's text editors and kind of what's important there. And as we're coding the email or text editor, we're validating the work that we're doing inside of a web browser. So our philosophy when doing emails is to test early and test often. You want to verify the code as you're actually working on it. 
having a tight feedback loop is really important because it lets you experiment with the email, not just for what works and what doesn't work, but also just how does the email look as you're coding it up and how might it look on different devices. Uh, you don't want to get too far down the wrong path, and because it takes a lot longer to code the email, to inline it, drop it inside of a service provider, and send it out, that whole loop maybe takes like three or four minutes, while if you're just verifying it in your web browser, you're talking like three or four seconds where you code it, you save it, you command tab over to your browser, and you press reload, and you can verify the work inside of the web browser. We use Google Chrome for testing because we like the inspector, but really any modern web browser that has a great inspector is going to do the trick. Whatever you're the most familiar with, you do web development, you may have a favorite. Firefox is really solid as well. Uh, if you're not familiar with what the inspector is inside of a browser, uh, in all modern browsers, you can right click on an element in a web page and say inspect element, and it will open this panel over here. By default, it's docked on the bottom. There is a, uh, a little, uh, you can't see it here, but uh, there's a little guy in the top right that lets you dock it on the top right or pop it out. And what it does is it shows you the rendered markup for the page. Uh, one small nuance is if you right click and say view source, that's the source markup that you are serving to the browser. The inspected markup, the rendered markup, uh, might have repairs that the browser does to the markup. So say for example, you forget to close a table element. The browser may see that and try to fix that for you, and that's what you'll see in this markup here. If you want to see the source markup that's untouched, then you want to right-click and, and, and view source. Um, but what's cool about the inspected element and the rendered markup is that you can click on it, and you can see all the styles that are applied to it. You can modify the attributes of that style, and you can see those changes in real time inside the browser. So if you're playing with getting the sizing just right of some text or working on the padding or the spacing, you can do that here in the inspector and then go back into your source code and make the change there and save it off. Uh, if you've done web development, I'm sure you spent tons of time doing this. Uh, it's a super handy tool. Here's a better screenshot of this. Like I was saying, it lets you tweak the CSS directly inside of the browser. One small detail of the Chrome is that also the Chrome inspector is it also shows you what your current dimensions are. So if you're debugging specific window sizes, or you're debugging a breakpoint, you can see exactly what dimensions that you're at. Uh, it also makes it really easy to test both in the desktop and the mobile layouts. If you take the inspector and you dock it on the right, you can shrink your window down, you still have plenty of room for the inspector, and you can get a rough sense of what would your email look like on a, on a mobile phone. So uh, there is some nuance to how this is going to be different than an actual native device, but you are able to get the gist of what does it look like on a larger screen, and what is the email going to look like on a phone? Like I was saying, it's not a replacement for real testing. It's really a supplement, and it's really for being able to verify the code, uh, verify the design as you're going to. Um, they're going to have all the features, and they're going to work. So if you're using components, if you're using buttons or a grid or a template that's already been tested to work across different email clients, you're probably fine to do the design in the web browser, which is why we make that choice, right? So we've already tested components or we're using components that we know are going to work in our email clients. So we're using the web browser as a way to verify our work as we do it. The web browser is definitely not a place for you to test what you think is going to work inside the email clients. Um, because again, it is so much more fully featured. So if you are able to figure out how to do something on the browser, it doesn't mean anything for that that's going to work in the email client. 